Hi everyone, um, welcome to our February clinical year anatomy seminars. Thanks for bearing with us. Um, we're really excited to have Claire Trokes here to speak on uh, the brain bank, which you may or may not know about, but it's around the corner, um, hidden away. And yeah, I'm going to Thanks, Michael. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk about brain banking in general, sort of what the concepts are and um, what the history is. I'm going to talk a bit more about specifically the, the brain bank here. Then I'm going to talk a bit about the projects we're involved in and some sort of ideas for the future, how the brain banks, brain banks are going to be working together more as networks. Um, so obviously the objectives of a brain bank are to facilitate and to encourage brain donation. Everything we do, we do through a license by the Human Tissue Authority. The consent we take is informed consent, so that means giving someone enough time to properly think about what it means to donate your brain, to discuss it with your family, talk to your GP, all that sort of thing. Probably as, as with your studies, people can withdraw consent at any time, they're under no obligation if they do just ask us for information or even if they sign the, the consent form. An important thing we do is each brain we receive gets a full pathological diagnosis and a lot of people say this is partly the reason they, they want to donate and they want their family to get those final results. Was it really Alzheimer's? Was it something else? Did they have strange clinical presentation because actually it wasn't uh, what the GP or the specialists actually thought? Um, so we're able to provide the families um, with feedback about what we actually find when we do the, the diagnosis on the tissue. Obviously our, our main goal is to provide well-preserved and well-characterised brain tissue for neuroscience researchers. By doing that, we hope that we can facilitate collaboration between the basic research scientists who are using this tissue at the bench, the clinicians who are seeing people during their lives, seeing what symptoms they actually have and how the disease progresses, and the pathologists who are looking at the brain to see after someone has died. Um, we hope as well that we're continuing to maintain and improve standards in tissue banking for the archiving, for the storage, the best ways of preserving tissue for the use in the most up-to-date research. And again, everything we do in that manner is regulated by the, the Human Tissue Authority. These are our, our set of minus 80 freezers that we have over in the brain bank. Um, also, we aim to disseminate and promote knowledge of brain banking, both to people within the sort of scientific community, but to the general public as well. These are the people who are donating their brains, so we need to get out and tell them that, that we do need brains still and what sort of, sort of donations we're interested in. We also use the brains to provide teaching, training and information. Uh, so this is one of the brain cut sessions that are run over in the Mortrick Hospital every couple of months, um, where we show some of our cases. Uh, these are neurology students, but we get neurologists coming because maybe this is one of their patients. They want to see what the, the end result was, what was actually going on in the brain. And they are open to, to anyone who wants to come. So if you are interested in sort of coming to see either the brain bank or any particular types of donation, just let me know. Um, so why do we need brain tissue? We know a lot about common disorders like Alzheimer's disease, Lewy body dementia. But there's still a lot we don't understand. And as the population ages, generally, there's going to be more diseases that, that were once rare, that come through more. There might even be disorders emerging that we, that we don't know about yet. Obviously, we want to examine the pathology within the brain, what's going on within the brain cells that um, causes this memory loss and neurological problems and something like motor neuron disease. Hopefully, then, we can help to understand how these diseases develop, how they progress, what any causes might be, and the effects of any therapy that are available at the moment in order to try and help design new treatments. If we can get donations from people who've been really well clinically assessed during their life, then that's even more valuable because then we've got that clinical history. We can see what other diseases they might have had. Do they also have diabetes? Do they have hypertension? And we can link that with the, the pathology and the um, damage we're seeing within the brain. To do that, there's also a real need for what we call controlled tissue, so healthy brains. Maybe someone dies from a heart attack or a peripheral cancer. We want to know what happens. What does a young brain look like? What does an old brain look like? What's normal aging compared to a diseased brain? Um, 
Um, so if you haven't seen a, a brain before, uh, this is a nice healthy control brain. If we take a slice through the front and temporal region there, we get an image like this. Apologies if you're still eating your lunch. Um, so as most of you are probably aware, uh, you can see here nice round, um, full gyri. This is the hippocampus. You can see the uh, ventricles there, corpus callosum. In a brain with severe Alzheimer's disease, you can see the atrophy, you can see those widened sulci. And when we take a section through the same region, <coughs> you can see those enlarged, dilated ventricles. You can see the atrophy around the frontal regions, specifically around the temporal region, and that hippocampus has just disappeared. So even by eye, when we, we receive some of these donations, we get an indication of what the disease might be. Um, brain bankings have a vital role in some of the discoveries that have already happened. Uh, this is Augusta D, Alzheimer's patient he first described. So obviously we have the plaques and tangles in Alzheimer's, um, and then later on the acetylcholine, the identification of beta in the plaques and tau in the tangles. Uh, we've got dopamine deficiency in Parkinson's. And then more recently, uh, variant CJD linked to the BSC epidemic. Um, and TDP has <coughs> been identified in the last few years as the main pathology in frontotemporal dementia and some forms of motor neuron disease or, or ALS. Um, currently, we think the, the most important things that we need to keep banking brains for are going to be large scale genetic studies. So people doing um, studies like that are looking for not just all the Alzheimer brains we might have here, which is over 300, but all the Alzheimer brains in the whole country to join with all the ones in the States to do these massive studies. As I mentioned, the clinical pathological study is going to be really, really important as diagnosis gets better, as things like imaging, um, biomarkers become more uh, valuable tools. We want to see how that correlates with what's actually going on pathologically. Um, as I mentioned, biomarkers, and then obviously the effect, effects of potential medications. We want to start linking in with clinical trials, get people who are on some of these new drugs to autopsy to have a look at what's really going on in their brain as well as what's happening to them clinically. Um, so the brain map here was established in 1989. This is Professor Lantoff, who first started the brain map. Over 1,700 cases are now stored. Um, our director is currently Dr. Safra Siraj, who's the head of clinical neuropathology over the hospital. We get our, most of our funding from the Medical Research Council, and we are located in Four Windsor Wharf, so the Addiction Sciences Building, in the basement, in case you're thinking I've never, never seen you in there. <laughs> um, we are embedded within the Centre for Neurodegenerative neurodegeneration research here, which means that we're directly working with the people actually using this tissue, which is great because we can get feedback about the quality of the tissue, the types of tissue they might be interested in, are we preserving it the right way, what do they think they might need in the future, and we can sort of try and direct maybe the patient groups we're advertising to, things like that, with the way the research is going. Um, we work closely with King's College Hospital. All the diagnosis is done there, so it's done in clinically accredited labs, and we can give someone the same sort of report that we would give a coroner or a police officer if a brain came in in the medical legal system. We um, have several members of, of permanent staff, and we have the neuropathologists who work with us on a rotor system. We also have a steering committee. Uh, both a, a local committee and an external steering committee who can guide us about things like um, sh who should we be giving tissue to, if we get a request from a commercial company maybe that we're a bit unsure of, where should we go in future directions, who should we be targeting, which sort of patient groups. So that consists of external scientists and also lay members, charity reps, MRC reps, people like that. And we meet once a year, twice a year for the local committee. Um, I'm going to talk a bit more about this later on, but we're part of a network of brain banks set up a few years ago called Brains for Dementia Research. This is a project actually funded by the Alzheimer's Charities, the Alzheimer's Society and ARUK, and it consists of ourselves, Oxford, Manchester, Newcastle, Bristol and Cardiff brain banks, um, and the coordinating centre is based at Guy's, part of King's College London, um, and we'll, we'll talk more about sort of the 
the reasons behind setting up that network later on. We are also part of a European network, so the BrainNet Europe Consortium, which was funded by um, FP6 Money, so directly to as a sort of networking project. That consists of 20 brain banks. The money has run out, but we are sort of continuing to try and self-fund ourselves, basically trying to make sure standards are the same, both within the sort of preservation of tissue and sort of the ethics and the consent issues. Also, just make sure, you know, diagnosis, that everyone's calling the same disease, the same thing, everyone's using the same criteria um, to give these diseases their, their classification and their staging systems. So there's been a number of publications come out of that sort of about sort of new staging systems. In the future, there is going to be a UK brain bank network funded by the MRC, and again, I'll come to that at, at the end of the talk. Um, so how do we go about getting a brain donation? Um, so it makes everything easier if people sort of register beforehand. It means we don't have to go to the family at a time when they're distressed. It means we have all the information we need. So we have a, a register, we have a secure database, and we have the paper consent forms. Um, people who are willing to donate, either they've consented themselves or legally we can take consent from the next of kin if they are already past that stage in the disease they can give consent themselves. Um, we just ask that the family know this isn't something they would have objected against. So it's sort of <coughs> um, affirmation of, of the consent. Um, having said that, we can accept what we call ad hoc donations. So we are quite often called, someone's just died, the family just thought about this, or they've just found some sort of paperwork that indicates this is what the person really wanted. And, um, you know, if we can get consent out, email or fax consent out, we can arrange those donations as well. We are taking consent for the post-mortem, the removal of the brain, and in some cases the spinal cord. Obviously, the, the collection of that, the storage and retention of that tissue, disposal of tissue if we ever need to do it, that's something else that's regulated by the HTA. Obviously, use in research and use in undefined research. So we're not just using this tissue for projects that we know about. This is a resource that's going to be used for projects that you know haven't been decided yet. Um, and consent for the release of medical records. We want to look at any assessments people have done. We want to look at their GP records to see what else was going on in their sort of medical history. If someone dies at home or we need to move someone to a different hospital to do that brain donation, we make all those arrangements and we also handle any extra cost. So the family shouldn't be put out at all by, by offering to donate the brain. We have a 24-hour on-call system, a credit pager system, so although we can't do anything out of hours nowadays, uh, we can advise the family that we know about um, their relative dying and we can advise them on, on what to do. As I said, the brain and the spinal cord, in cases of motor neuron disease, obviously that's where the main pathology is, like temporal dementia because of the link between MND and FTLD, and in control cases because we want to see what a healthy spinal cord looks like, um, we will take consent and we will remove the spinal cord. Um, ideally, we'd like to do that within 48 hours. 72 hours is normally our limit because after that, things like proteins, RNA and DNA are starting to degrade. But occasionally, say if someone dies, um, on a Friday morning, we can't do anything until, until the Monday, we will go over that limit for, for some circumstances. At the moment, we're receiving about 80 to 100 new donations each year. When we receive the new brain here, um, we've divided in half into two hemispheres. One hemisphere is fixed in a buffered formalin solution for analysis at the hospital. The other half we freeze and we store in those minus 80 freezers. We straight away we send a letter of condolence and thanks to the family and we request the medical notes from the donor. The neuropathology examination takes at least three months for the various stages that it needs to go to. So once that's produced, we should have a definite diagnosis. We can send that out to the GP, any consultants and the family if they've requested that. Otherwise, we simply send them a letter saying what the diagnosis was. Once we have the the tissue classified go into our database and it then becomes available to researchers here within the rest of the UK and in fact internationally. Um, this is how we process our, our frozen tissue. So this is a, a fresh brain 
uh, we're dividing it in half, we randomise which half we fix and which we freeze. Um, if there's any particular sort of worse pathology on one side, we'll fix that side so the pathology can have a better look. Um, with the half we're freezing, we slice um, chromally. We get about 14 sections, which we lay out on a cool cutting board. We take 50 small blocks, so about one centimetre square blocks, from the sort of most relevant regions, the most disease relevant, and the most requested, um, and we freeze those in small bags on a brass plate. So they're freezing very quickly, but not so quickly they might crack if we did it in liquid nitrogen or something like that. Um, and they're freezing flat. And when someone asks me for a particular region of the brain, I can just take out that very small piece and give them a sample of that, rather than sort of defrosting a whole whole slice, which we used to do in the past, which is uh, quite bad for, for RNA degradation. So, in most cases, we're able to take fixed and frozen tissue. If we've gone over our 72-hour limit, or for some, um, sometimes for other reasons, like potential infections, we actually fix the whole brain. Um, so we have over 14,000 cases, slightly less than, than the total which includes all the fixed. Um, as you probably expect, the large majority of those are Alzheimer's disease. Uh, we have mixed dementias being diagnosed a lot more now, Alzheimer's and, and dementia blue bodies, and the pure dementia blue bodies. We have a large collection of motor neuron disease. We work very closely with the clinic across the road, Chris Shaw and Anna Archibaldi. Um, and we also have our control grades. So this probably looks quite good, but if you consider that everyone that's asking me for tissue from all these diseases also wants control tissue, and that these cases are being sort of used up quite a lot, we'd really like that to be a lot larger. Um, we have small collections of, of other diseases, schizophrenia, uh, autism, some of the childhood disorders like Rett's disease, Batten's disease. Um, so as I said, tissue is freely available, legally we can't charge for tissue, we can sort of try and recover some of our costs for couriers or if I'm cutting lots of slides. Um, but essentially the tissue is free to UK based and overseas researchers. Uh, we have a tissue request form that people can fill in to determine exactly what they want, what sort of tissue, what are they going to do with it, where do they work, do they have the appropriate health and safety aspects in place. Um, usually we'd like that request to be combined with ethical approval for the project. We do have our own ethical approval and we can work with pilot studies. So if someone wants to just test something or prove a concept or that it's the first time they've ever worked with human tissue, we can do that under our ethics. But once something becomes a sort of full study, we'd ask the group to get their, their own ethics. And we have a, an internal brain bank committee that looks at each request, looks at the amount of tissue people are asking for and what they're going to do with it and approves or declines the request. I must say, in the, the last five years, we've only declined two requests. Most people we can just go back to and discuss whether they really need that much tissue and, and work with them. Um, so, in the last six years, we've supplied over 12,000 small samples, either fixed or frozen, uh, to over 250 research projects. Um, since 1989, uh, we've supplied at least 1,300 different projects. Um, and we don't ask for authorship on papers, but we do ask that the source of the tissue is acknowledged as the brain bank here. Um, that's difficult to enforce, especially if you know papers don't come out until three or four years later sometimes. Uh, but we know that we've been acknowledged in over 350 publications since the bank was started. The tissue we store, if we keep it in that minus 80 or we keep it in the fixed wet formalin or its fixed blocks, is useful for, for many years. We've still got samples from the, the early 1990s. Um, we can keep using that tissue for, for projects. Uh, these are some recent projects. I'm not going to go through them all, but just to, to show you the sort of spread. Obviously, we've got a lot of Alzheimer's tissue. People here, some of the group, are very interested in Alzheimer's, so we do a lot of work with them. With Chris Shaw and Amar, we're doing a lot of work with MMD and frontotemporal temporal dementia. Um, with John Cooper and Batman's disease, uh, we've also got uh, projects where we've been to in Huntington's, NSA, epilepsy, PSP. We also do some of our own research about the best ways of preserving this tissue, how useful really is this old tissue we've got for new techniques, um, and getting feedback from, from researchers about what they might want in the future. Uh, and these are some of the 
requesters of those samples. So probably about 50% of the requests in the last six years have gone to this group up here, people in the IOP itself, people in the rest of London. Um, we're also giving a lot out to other people within the UK. We've got our collaborations in Europe, and people sort of find out about us through that. Um, also in the States, um, and sort of various uh, further worldwide areas. Um, and we do get publications, we are informed and we are authors on some of these, and they are in good journals, <coughs> Science, Neuropathology, which is uh, an internal research I'll talk about next. Um, a group here, Peter Peter's group in biological psychiatry, um, and a group of medical Road in the Ray. Um, so just to show you what sort of research we can do ourselves on the brains and how it is so useful to have that sort of bank and resource of tissue. Um, in 2009, one of our neuropathologists, Andrew King, reported on a very interesting case, uh, frontal temporal dementia. And usually that has lots of inclusions within the, certainly the frontal cortex and the temporal regions that are positive for P62 and TDP43. In this case, he saw that they did have those inclusions, but they also had different inclusions in the cerebellum, which is something not normally considered to be involved in frontotemporal dementia. They were P62 positive, but they were TPP43 negative. He wrote up that one case report. We then looked back at all our, or a, a number of our frontotemporal and our motor neuron disease cases, and he was able to publish another report two years later saying that actually, if you look carefully enough, you see these cerebellum inclusions in a number of different diseases across that spectrum, where you'd normally expect them all to be TDP43 positive. So we suggested at the end of this paper that maybe we were seeing a subset of disease, maybe there was something else going on that we didn't know about in these people. Last year, the long-awaited gene on chromosome 9 for transgenic dementia and ALS risk was discovered and shown to be uh, C9O72. We looked back at our cases, and in fact, what we can now say is that the, the C9 off expansion, the P62 TDP negative inclusions, are the hallmark of that. They will identify cases with that genetic mutation or that genetic expansion. And here you can see um, the, all the brown areas of inclusions. This is a nice inclusion there. And these are actually intranuclear inclusions, which again haven't been seen before. That was sort of a new finding linked to these C9-off cases. Uh, what that also meant was that I could tie up something I've been working on, which was a subset, again, of patients who had, um, front, uh, they had motor neuron disease, but what we saw was a large level of P62, this is in the cerebellum again, um, nice brain in the cerebellum, um, no TPP43, not big day, you'd find them in the, the same inclusions. This is the hippocampus, all those red spots are P62 inclusions, and the green are TPP, so you can see there's not per localization. Very few of those inclusions are, are also TPP positive. Um, when we did Western blots on um, frontal cortex and hippocampal samples, these um, cases, V1, V2, V4, look much more like frontal dementia than the controls from the motor neuron disease. This is P62 at the top. So they have a large amount of P62 in the frontal regions, but they don't have any cognitive decline, which was interesting. And when we looked at the genetics with the Shores group, they also all have that C9 expansion. Okay, so I'm just going to talk now about a project we're involved in. I mentioned it briefly before, Brains for Dementia Research. Uh, so the coordinating centre is run by Professor Paul Francis at uh, the Wolfson card. It consists of brain banks and a collection centre at Cardiff. They then send their tissue to, to us to be stored. The aims of BDR are to raise public awareness of brain donation. So the charities initiated this project. They said they got phone calls all the time about people who'd heard something about brain donation but they didn't know how they could do it or where they could go to. They thought we all so we've used our own patients and we kept the tissue for ourselves. So that was the sort of initial start of this. Um, we want to increase donations of dementia and especially that control brain tissue. 
and to collect the highest quality tissue, so sort of low post-mortem delay, people who um, we know what's happened to the tissue before it reaches us, and importantly, with longitudinal clinical assessments. So as part of the BDR project, people just don't just sign up for brain donation, they sign up to be assessed by one of the research workers in the old age culture unit once a year for people with a dementia and every couple of years for people without, so we can really monitor the progress of the disease. Um, it also will help us with our controls because we get a lot of people who sign up as a control. When they actually come to us, they're no longer a control. But we don't see that until we, we look at the pathology. Um, that will also help identify people with, with mild cognitive impairment and we can look at, at how that changes into a, a sort of full-blown dementia. Um, another comment that, that the charities had was that researchers also don't know how to get access to the tissue. They don't know where the brain banks are and how they can apply. So they want to have an online database that we all put our cases into that people can see exactly what we've got and, and how they can request it. They want to standardise procedures to minimise differences between brain banks. So we're all sampling in the same way, we're all freezing in the same way, we're all diagnosing in the same way. Um, so the protocol with the frozen blocks that I showed you, we're now trying to uh, roll that out throughout the whole six centres. And obviously there's no point asking people to donate and collecting all this tissue if no one then uses it. So Paul Francis spends a lot of time going out to conferences encouraging people who might not have thought of using tissue to think about it and um, showing people sort of how useful it, it can actually be. Um, it's been pretty successful so far. So in the first three years, over 1,000 people have signed up. Um, you can see the spread here of patients in, in red and the controls in blue. We are only taking people at the moment for assessments who are over 70. So many people signed up who actually went from over 65 to over 70. But people within this group can sign up and then when they become of that age, they'll be contacted again. Uh, we also do take people with uh, early onset dementias. Uh, they are assessed. Um, so as you can imagine, a lot of the controls are in the young age and then a lot of the cases are coming up to be over 80 age. Um, brains are being donated, they are coming through. Um, you can see here the spread over the different banks. Bristol only joined us about six months ago, so they're allowed to have only had one case so far. Uh, so 156 so far, um, and at least 98 of those people had at least one initial assessment and a follow-up visit or assessment over the phone. So we should have some really good clinical data for all those 98 brains. They'll go onto the database with their neuropath data, things like pH, um, how old the patient was, what the final diagnosis was, and that will be linked up with a clinical database so we can get full information for any people who want to know that. Um, so to steal one of Paul's slides, BDR aims to facilitate the best science by the best brains on the best brains. Um, and the MRC think this is going pretty well, it's a good idea. So based on the VDR network and previously the BrainNet Europe consortium, uh, they want to set up this MRC UK BrainNet network. Currently that, the MRC fund four of the banks, ourselves, uh, the Sudden Death and HIV brain banks in Edinburgh, uh, Newcastle Brain Bank and a specific control brain bank set up about a year ago in Oxford. So we're being asked now to work together as a network to set up common standards and our next one application will need to be done as one application for, for a network rather than the four of us separately, which is going to be interesting. Um, the network director is Professor James Ironside, who's based at the Edinburgh Bank. Um, but the eventual aim will be to incorporate all the banks and all the different funders so there are other banks sponsored by the Parkinson's Disease Society, the Multiple Sclerosis Society, smaller independent charities, and um, to bring them all under the one network. We're already having regular meetings with all the other brain banks, and the, the eventual aim as well is to collaborate with the UK Biobank, so the people taking blood samples and demographic measurements at the moment from a large number of population, and the MRC DNA Bank. Uh, these are the other brain banks just within the UK, so there's quite a few, 
but we all are, all have sort of certain things we concentrate on, and a lot of the other banks have sort of regional um, criteria. They can only accept people within a certain distance from their bank. But at the moment, we actually take cases from throughout the UK. Um, so the network aims are to provide operational efficiency for the benefit of the donors, also the researchers, and future patients who this is, you know, the tissue is being donated for. Um, as I said, the banks are being asked to define and set up some sort of gold standards for the tissue banking, which includes the actual donation procedure, the consent procedures, access to the tissue, um, and our protocols um, on how we actually sample and how we. Um, designate that tissue on our databases. Um, eventually as well the network will hope to find ways to speed up um, and to sort of target certain tissue that people are saying is lacking and again that, that sort of sought after control tissue so we're going to be working with the coroners and the tissue transplant coordinators a lot more to try and increase the donations of, of healthy brains. Um, the NRC has set up a website um, which tells you about the brain banks and about some of the, the science behind brain banking. And again, we will have a, an online search for database. Um, so you need to register as a researcher, but after that you then have access to, to which brain bank the cases are in. You can search by a clinical diagnosis, you know, path diagnosis, age, um, gender, all those sorts of things. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Yeah. Hi Claire, it's, cool it's clearly much more oriented to sports to dementia. Um, I have a specific interest in epilepsy. Yeah. Two questions. One, do you know how many epilepsy cases you have by sort uh, syndrome? And also, is there any research on the relation between uh, neuropathology and imaging? So for example, patients with epilepsy. Yeah. You Ordinarily, we have uh, clinical imaging. To yeah. Find, for example, we have a lot of you know what the cancer yeah. process is. But we see a lot of extra hippocampal atrophy. It'd be really nice to go in to the the, yeah. the, the brain to to, to 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 qualify what these extra hippocampal yeah. yeah. atrophies are. I think this kind of thing can be done before. Um, not so much. So we have a few epilepsy brains. Um, some of them will have come as coronary donations. So the use of whole brains and they may have died suddenly either through, through epilepsy or, or not. Um, I think we have about 10 altogether with a clinical diagnosis of epilepsy. Some of those will also have had a dementia. It will just be a you know, coincidence they have both. Um, but we do, yeah, we do have a few. I'm not sure we know sort of subtypes and things, but I can, we can certainly have a chat about, about what we've got. Um, as for the imaging, I think, I mean, we are talking to, to people here, uh, Ishan Bodhi, one of the, the other neuropathologists, has quite an interest in, in epilepsy. So he's done a, a little bit of work and he's worked with some of the, the guys here. Um, but I don't know how much is going on so far about the, the correlation. Um, there's some work going on in Newcastle where they are scanning donated brains and they're looking at white matter lesions and how well what you see on an image correlates with what you then see on a, on a histological slice. Um, at the Netherlands Brain Bank, they also they have the funding to scan every brain and they're sort of doing similar things. At the moment, we, we don't have that funding, but we're certainly very open to, to it, you know, if you have any ideas. And that's really important. So, 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 that comes to the Yeah. So, very <laughs> Yeah. Um, we're snap freezing in a way because we're using the brass plate. We found that if we use liquid nitrogen, the, the tissue cracks and you lose some of the, the morphology. So we're freezing as quickly as we can. Um, the feedback we get is that the, the quality is a lot better now, certainly for the RNA integrity. Um, obviously some things change, but there, it's probably more the, the post-mortem degradation that, that changes it rather than the, the freezing. 
Um, with the fixed tissue, it, it's a whole hemisphere for a couple of weeks to allow the uh, fixed tissue to, to fully penetrate. Then it will go over to the hospital. It will again be sliced coronally. Um, from that, we'll take um, about 15 blocks, which are wax embedded sections cut from them, and they're used for, for staining for, for amyloid or tau or, or any of the things that are needed to help with the diagnosis. Um, GFAP, microglial activating markers in. You know, it's not a The frozen we just keep for research purposes. All the histology is done on the, the fixed. If you do histology on the frozen, yeah, you will get freezing artifacts. But some of the antibodies work much better on frozen. So, yeah. Yeah, there probably and there probably is some change, maybe a bit of shrinkage or something in with the freezing. There's a, there's a tiny bit of shrinkage in with the formalin fixing. Yes. So now the the tissue is is in vivo before the donation occurs. Um, not through the brain bank, but some of the patients that are coming to it... Yeah, but, but the brain bank can to reach No, no, but if um, someone... Is in, the, the um, if someone gives us money to do that, we'll, we'll do it. But <laughs> at the moment, we're struggling just for, you know, what we are doing. Um, yeah, we, do, we have people who have had imaging if they're part of one of the trials going on, or if um, now with our consent, you know, if we know there are research assessments available, we can request those as part of the, the sort of clinical history. But yeah, it's it's becoming more common, but it's certainly something that, that needs a lot of work. But the um, in the next round of the BDR application, which will be in a couple of years' time, there's going to be a lot more emphasis on sort of multi-samples, so blood samples in life and in death, CSF, imaging, things like that, to build up a really thorough clinical history. And with the, the sort of electronic patient records and the access to them, again, that should become better. Okay, well, thanks for coming and thanks very much for the talk. Thank it was you. great. Our next one is the 15th of March, um, and there'll be a